Start basketball. Hey, hoop heads! Wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. We've had their partnership manager and training specialist Jefferson Mason, and their marketing manager Nick Bartlett on the show in the past, and we couldn't be more excited about what they're doing for the game of basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market, and they truly accelerate skill development faster than ever. Beyond efficient reps, Dr. Dish provides training expertise and versatility designed to develop complete players. The new Dr. Dish CT machine has further revolutionized basketball training with over 150 plus on-demand individual and team workouts from some of the best coaches and trainers in the game. These workouts include video instruction and combine game-like shooting drills with ball handling, conditioning, and agility drills. Along with workouts, the Dr. Dish training management system also provides stat tracking and analytics to track progress and ensure accountability. These are just a few reasons why top programs like Duke, North Carolina, Louisville, Florida, Baylor, and countless others are upgrading to Dr. Dish. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoopheads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Also, make sure to check out the new Dr. Dish Home Machine, which is perfect for these crazy times when gyms and schools are closed. Visit drdishbasketball.com for details. That's a great deal, Hoopheads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. Hi, this is Coach Dan DeCrane from Gilmore Academy, and you're listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast. Prepare like the pros with the all-new FastDraw and Fast Scout. FastDraw has been the number one play diagramming software for coaches for years, and now with its integrated web platform, coaches have the ability to add video to plays and share them directly to their players' Android and iPhones via their mobile app. You'll quickly see why Fast Model Sports has the most compelling and intuitive basketball software out there. In addition to a great product, they also provide basketball coaching content and resources through their blog and play bank. For access to these plays and more information, visit FastModelSports.com or follow them on Twitter at FastModel. This episode is brought to you by the Ready State Virtual Mobility Coach. Dr. Starrett is a movement and mobility coach for players in the NFL, MLB, NHL, and NBA, plus a doctor of physical therapy. Kelly has created a program called Virtual Mobility Coach. Every day, Virtual Mobility Coach gives you guided mobility videos. It walks you step-by-step step through Kelly's proven techniques to relieve pain, improve range of motion, and improve performance. Try it completely free for two weeks, and if you decide to continue, you can get 10% off for life using promo code HOOPHEADS10. Visit thereadystate.com slash hoopheads and use code HOOPHEADS10 at checkout. Again, that's thereadystate.com slash hoopheads and use code HOOPHEADS10 when you sign up to get 10% off for the life of your membership after your 14-day free trial ends. No job is too big or too small. You do it. Because it's it's what's best for the team. It's what's best for the success. Maybe not today or tomorrow, but sustainable success. Christopher Spartz is the inventor and founder of Swish. He is also the creator of Christopher Spartz Basketball and Spartz Sports. Chris has been in and around basketball for decades. His experiences as a player, then later as a coach and trainer, have given him the valuable insight into how the game is played, taught, and coached. Having participated in the highest levels of play, his passion for coaching has led to the creation of Swish for use by players of all ages at all levels of play. Prior to founding Spart Sports, Christopher was an assistant coach for the Costa Rican national basketball team as they prepared for the FIBA World Championships in 2015. From 2013 to 2015, Sparts was the recruiting and operations coordinator for the men's basketball team at The Ohio State University under Thad Mata. He served as an assistant coach at his alma mater, St. Ambrose University, from 2011 through 2013. 
As a player, Sparks played four years at St. Ambrose and then toured the world as a member of the Washington Generals, competing against the Harlem Globetrotters while playing in more than 30 different countries. We recently launched the Hoopheads Mentorship Program. We believe that having a mentor is the best way to maximize your potential and become a transformational coach. By matching you up with one of our experienced mentors, you'll develop a one-on-one relationship that will help your coaching, your team, your program, and your mindset. The Hoopheads Mentorship Program delivers mentoring services to basketball coaches at all levels through our team of experienced head coaches. Find out more at hoopheadspod.com or shoot me an email directly, mike at hoopheadspod.com. Our roster of shows is growing, so don't forget to check out all our other podcasts on the Hoopheads Pod Network, including Thrive with Trevor Huffman, Beyond the Ball, the CoachMaze.com podcast, Players Court, Bleachers and Boards, The Green Light, and our team-focused NBA podcasts, Cavalier Central, Knuck If You Buck, 305 Culture, Blazing the Path, Hashtag Lakers, Motor City Hoops, X's and O's NBA Breakdown, Spanning the Spurs, LA Hoops, and the Wizards Hoops Analyst. We're looking for more NBA podcasters interested in hosting their own show centered on a particular team. Email us info at hoopheadspod.com if you're interested in learning more and bringing your talent to our network. Grab some pen and paper now so you're prepared to learn from Christopher Sparts, inventor and founder of Swish. Hello and welcome to the Hoopheads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here without my co-host Jason Sunkel tonight, but I am pleased to be joined by Christopher Sparts from Swish Official. Christopher has created a unique shooting sleeve product that can help players to improve their jump shot. And so he's come on tonight to be able to share that with us. Christopher, welcome to the podcast, first of all. Thank you for having me, Mike. It's a, it's a pleasure. We are excited to be able to have you on, learn more about your product, how it can help basketball players improve their shot, and also learn a little bit about the history of how you came to create the product. So why don't you give us a quick overview before we dive a little bit into your background and how the company got started. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. You know, I've been a big fan and, and I've been listening to you since quarantine started and it's been it's really cool to to finally be here and be be sharing this brand new product with you. you know, we we developed Swoosh and it really has been a team effort. Uh, I developed Swoosh uh, with with a bunch of different people, but really the you know, what we came to was a product that controls 41% of the shot. It's a staggering number because there's nothing else on the planet that you know, provides or generates as much as 17% of the interest of someone's jump shot. So we're really excited about that. And what it does is it really allows the player to understand what a shot feels like and looks like a good one, one that will generate a swoosh more times than if you're shooting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shots and you're not able to decipher what's good and what's bad about it. And what we've done, which is super unique and which is really, really cool and exciting for us is we've tied a three-step shooting process that allows you to really understand what it's supposed to feel like to be a great shooter and it's for players young and old and man it's this is a really exciting time for us uh, not just because it's 2021 i think we're all excited to step into that <laughs> new era but but because we've now launched it we're we're live about a month in here and it's it's generated a lot of interest and excitement and uh, we're just really fortunate to be able to be here and share that on, on your podcast all right, before we dive into your background and we work our way up to getting into a more detailed explanation of the product, why don't you first share right off the top here, where can people go to find out more? So if they're jumping on and listening to this episode and they're like, okay, I'm intrigued by what I'm hearing, where can they go to find out more about the product? And then we'll dive into your background. Yes, they can go to swishofficial.com. That's S-W-S-H official. Dot com. And they can find out more about it. They can buy their own there. Or they could go to our Instagram page at swish, S-W-S-H underscore official. And or they can find me at, at Coach C Sparts and you'll find out more information there as well. Awesome. All right. So give us your background, Chris. Talk to me a little bit about 
how you came to be involved in this space, what's your basketball background, what's your business background, and how did you come up with the idea for this product? Sure. Well, I, I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. I, I played many, many sports and then, you know, eventually settled in in college and played just basketball. I was a part of a Final Four program, a Sweet 16 team at the Division II NAI level and, you know, played for a legendary coach has more wins than John Wooden. So I was, I was spoiled in that respect, played with some great teammates and, had an opportunity to play basketball after college. I played in 36 countries professionally in, in 48 states. And, and it wasn't long before I, my, my career ended and a new one started. And I got into sales uh, in, in Chicago and I loved it. I really did. And, but I missed basketball. So I went back. I got my master's at my alma mater at St. Ambrose University and had a chance to coach with the very same coach that I played for, which was a really treat to see him in a different light. Um, Coach Ray Shevlin. And then it wasn't long after I earned my master's degree that I had an opportunity to go and coach at the Ohio State University and coach with Thad Mata and the Buckeyes. And when I was there, I was the recruiting and operations coordinator. And in back-to-back years, we had top five recruiting class in the country, had an opportunity to coach and be around uh, some great people, likes of Aaron Kraft and D'Angelo Russell and Kato Bates, D'Ap, Jay Sean Tate, and the list goes on and on. But uh, then had an opportunity to coach the Costa Rican national team as they prepared for the FIBA World Championships and was at a really unique space where, you know, I found the love of my life in, in Ohio and wanted to spend more time with her and build a life. And we, what we decided to do was go back to Chicago and build a business around basketball. And so now we have, we run a premier basketball academy out of the suburbs of Chicago where now we offer a suite of services from group individual workouts, travel teams, camps, clinics, showcases. And we're very fortunate to have trained players from seven different NBA organizations, players from six different continents, right out of the suburbs of Chicago. And and so it's been fun building and growing with these individuals and families that we serve. But, you know, along the way, I stumbled upon some, some fun ideas and concepts. And then Wow. Two years after we started, here we are at Swish and we've launched it and it's been a lot of fun. And here I am talking to you, Mike on Hoop Head Spot. It's, this, is, this is really cool. <laughs> well, there's a lot to unpack from what you just said in terms of your background. So let's maybe work backwards and talk about some of the different things that you've been able to do as a player and then that you've been able to do as a coach. One of the questions that I have to ask of anybody who has played basketball overseas anywhere is what is what's the craziest story you can tell me about your time playing overseas and keeping in mind that we we try to keep it PG thirteen as far as the sto- as far as far as the stories go but everybody has everybody I know that has played overseas has at least one crazy story r- r- somehow related to their basketball playing experience so give me give me the best one that you feel comfortable sharing on the pod. Yeah, well, I, I, I guess I have two really cool ones. Uh, one was we played in Romania. And Romania at the time was, I mean, a third world country. And it was in a really, really rough spot. But at the same time, uh, we're in the, 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 the capital city of Bucharest and we're invited to the parliament, which is one of the largest uh, governmental buildings in the world. And uh, you go up there and you get checked by the security and it you have gold encrusted room by, you know, like by gold encrusted room and there's nothing in it. There's not like it was, it blew my mind just the, the, the mass of this place. And you sit in there and you meet with the, um, the head of, their their government and and then we go out and we look out over the balcony to the city of Romania that was just it was it was really struggling at the time and so it offered it was it was crazy because there was so much perspective in that that in this 
amazing, wonderful place that it could close you off and offer you zero perspective if you close the doors. But all you had to do was look outside to to, to show you, hey, look, there's a lot that needs to be done here. Uh, let's focus. Let's get our hands dirty and let's make this place a little bit better. And so at the time, I was playing with the Washington Generals against the Harlem Globetrotters, and, and, and they're the ambassadors of goodwill. And so it wasn't but three and a half hours later that we're performing in front of 15,000 in, in, in Bucharest. And, you know, they wanted happiness. They wanted they wanted something more. They wanted something that they could hang on to that brought them some light in an in in, in otherwise life of, of turmoil and less than. And so it was a great, great moment that I look back on. I have these pictures from there. You go, wow. I, I remember literally like eight feet behind me was these golden crested rooms and eight feet behind me was this vast, vast world of, of a third world country. And so it was an interesting uh, moment for me. Uh, I think uh, another great moment was when I was playing with the Washington Generals against the Globetrotters. We played in, uh, we did a couple of, of tours for the troops overseas. Uh, for me, one of them was in Europe and then another one was in Asia. And I had an opportunity in Germany to sit down with some of the troops and eat and just, just connect. And it you want to talk about perspective. It was one of those like aha moments where you go, man, like, why are you here? And they're going, you have no idea what it means to us for you to wear a Washington General's jersey. You represent us. This is like, we, we're rooting for you. And I'm going, hey, I'm not the guy. They're the guys, right? Or you're the guys. And we're here to support you guys. And it was, it was I mean, I have the chills thinking about how special those moments were. Um, you know, be able to spend time with them, eat with them, and get to know them and their stories and where they came from and why they were serving. And it was really, really cool. So... Yeah, that's good. I, I really like hearing those stories about the experiences that people have. And just, again, when you think about us growing up here in the United States and then you get an opportunity to go and travel overseas and just how eye-opening it can be both in terms of the standard of living and the different situations that people all throughout the world live in. How did you get hooked up with the Washington Generals? What did that process look like? Because that's something that I don't think a lot of people necessarily in the basketball space even – even have a real idea of what the general's role is because obviously you go back to the 70s kind of during the heyday of the Globetrotters and most kids probably knew who the Washington generals were at that time, whereas today I don't think the knowledge is necessarily out there. So just talk a little bit about how you got connected to the generals and the Globetrotters and what that process was like. Well, that's a great question because I had the same question when they asked me to be a part of it, <laughs> Mike. So <laughs> I, I – I, had a, I received a call by a guy by the name of John Ferrari, and he was the GM of the Washington Generals. I go, that ain't true. That There's no way. There's no way this guy, this thing's real. And I talked to my agent. I said, why well, are not calling you? Um, because I was uh, looking at two other opportunities, in, one in Germany, one in London. And before you know it, he goes, hey, man, this is pretty cool. Like I'm looking into this a little bit. You get to travel the world. You get to continue to compete. Um, you're not scratching and clawing. Um, and if it goes right, you're going to have you know the same, same, if not better, opportunities. Um, having been a little bit more well versed in in the travel and those expectations that are tied to it, you know, I can sell that down the river. So I've, I. I got the call r randomly. Now I, I played in a couple of combines, and I think they got um, you know my contact information from that. But it was a really interesting uh, decision that I had to make. You know how legitimate was it? How you know? And so I only knew them from like the cartoon, right? And and so it was really cool though. The first time I ever met you know, like the Globetrotters, I'm, I'm walking into, they had already done a training camp and they didn't like the guy that they had. So they picked me. There you go. And, uh, so I, I rolled up to the, to, we were going on a military tour to Rota, Spain, and we were in uh, Virginia at a military base there. 
and I'm at the hotel and a bunch of globe travelers walking around. I go, hey, man, this is pretty cool. Um, and so before long, you end up building these great relationships with them. You know, I've been a part of Globetrotter weddings and, and them mine. And, you know, I've had a couple, there were a couple generals that were in my wedding. So these great relationships over, over time and traveling the world together, experiencing like real life together on the road was really unique and really special and, and holds a lot of great dear memories for me. Did you ever get hit in the head with the ball during one of the Globetrotters routines like I did? <laughs> Wait, you did? I did. So I'll tell you my story with the Globetrotters. I think I've told this once maybe on the podcast out of 400 episodes. So hopefully it's not too redundant for anybody who's listening. Hey, coaches, parents, and group leaders. I want to introduce you to our newest sponsor, SnapRaise. SnapRaise is the nation's largest digital donation platform built to help teams, youth groups, and clubs raise money quickly and efficiently without selling products. SnapRaise builds your group a customizable campaign website, and students use their mobile devices to connect and engage with their biggest fans. My son's high school team used SnapRaise this season, and our team raised all the money they needed to fund their season, and then some. Getting SnapRaise started is quick and free. Just visit SnapRaise.com and you'll get connected to a local SnapRaise expert in no time. When I was probably, and I was right shortly after I graduated from college, so I must have been 22, 23, 24, somewhere in that range. And there was a radio station contest where you had to come down and do like a one minute quote routine basketball routine and then you could be chosen to be a Washington general for a night here in Cleveland and play out at the old Richfield Coliseum and you would get an opportunity to be on the floor with the Globetrotters as a member of the Washington generals so somebody heard about this I didn't hear it on the radio but one of my friends heard about it and told me hey you should go and try to try to do this and at first I was kind of like eh, you know I, I don't know if I want to I don't know if I want to go do that and you know have somebody clowning on me and all this stuff and then the more I thought about it I'm like you know I kind of grew up grew up on the Globetrotters with the wide world of sports as a kid of the 70s and being able to see as you said you know you got them on the Scooby-Doo cartoons and everything else I'm like this would be again it's a unique experience in basketball that not many people get an opportunity to have so I went to the tryout and I, to be honest, I don't even remember what I did. I think I just shot the ball and just did normal basketball things. But I do remember other people doing like cartwheels with the ball and flips and all these other different things. And for whatever reason, they chose me. So like a week later, I got to go and got a uniform from the Washington Generals, which when I look at that uniform now, it was it was right at the tail end of the of the short shorts era. So when I look at that particular uniform and the, the clothes that I had, it was they they were they were small back then, and they're really small now that I'm a 50 year old man. But anyway, uh, so they went through, and I got to meet with the coach of the of the generals and and meet with the players, and they showed me they showed me one routine that I was going to be in. I was going to go in for play for a minute or two, something like that. And while I was playing, they were going to have me part of a, a thing where the Globetrotters were kind of doing doing a weave kind of around the top of the key where they're making passes. And basically what they told me is you have to stick to your Globetrotter, whoever it is that you're guarding, you have to stay right on their back in order to make sure that you don't get hit in the head with the ball. Well, somehow in the course of doing all that, I must not have stayed close enough to my Globetrotters back and I ended up taking a ball off the head during the during the routine. But I played a minute or two. At some point they called the foul. The ref let me go to the they let me go to the free throw line and they actually let me shoot two free throws. I was expecting obviously something to happen. I you know, my pants to get pulled down or who knows what, but I got to shoot my free throws unobstructed and I went two for two at the Richfield Coliseum as a member of the Washington Generals playing against the Harlem Globetrotters. So that is my Washington Generals Harlem Globetrotter claim to fame is getting hit in the head with a ball and going two for two at the line as a member of the Washington Generals. So somewhere in the annals of Washington Generals history, my name was etched in the in the scorebook. Probably not as often as yours, I'm sure. 
<laughs> no, how cool is that? That's an incredible story. I love it. And and you know, we had um we had different experiences like yours, but I don't remember anybody hitting those free throws. I mean, I remember the nerves. You could feel the nerves of our guest generals. I mean, you could, it was like it was palpable. So it's so funny that you say that because honestly, I can't remember anybody ever making the two free throws and not getting made fun of. So it sounds like you had a really wonderful experience as a Washington general. I did. I, I did. Like I said, I was I was really surprised that I didn't get you know that I didn't get made fun of. I thought that was clearly going to be part of uh, part of the deal, but. Again, I guess once I took a ball off the head, if they had anything planned for me, they decided probably getting hit in the head in front of 15,000 people was probably enough embarrassment for one night. So, <laughs> Well, it sounds like you took it well, and that was a great story. I love, I love hearing you know, more general Globetrotter stories. It's, it's awesome. It's really, really cool. Yeah, that's a fun experience, I'm sure. And as you said, to be able to go and get around to all those different countries and just be a part of it and, and see – see the world at a young age, um, you know, the, the value in that, just, just forget about the basketball side of it, but just as a human being, I'm sure, I'm sure it was, you know, incredibly valuable. And once you're done with that, then you come back and again, you get, you get a quote unquote real job, but eventually coaching starts calling your name. Why, why coaching? What was it about wanting to get back into coaching? And obviously you return back to your alma mater, as you said, with the coach that, coached you when you were playing there but what was it about coaching that was calling you was it just a matter of hey I really want to be involved in basketball is that the main driver and coaching seemed like the right way to do it or or what was the what was the genesis for you getting back into into the game of basketball as a coach that's a great question after I was done playing basketball I I really uh needed a break I don't think I picked up a ball for like eight months um but then uh I started like getting back into it by teaching back where I grew up and I would leave the city where I was living and go back out to the suburbs and, you know, work a kid out because somebody from the neighborhood knew that I was back and saw me as a resource that could help. And then I would run out like a camp or coach a team. And that was within like a two year span. And, and then I was, I started like going to games. And so it was like a natural progression back to the game. And it was a different like appreciation for the game. It was a different vantage point from the game. It wasn't as a player anymore. It was more as a, uh, an onlooker and like experiencing it in a new, in a new light and from, from a new lens. Right. And so then I got a call from you know, I literally got a call from my my head former head coach, and he said, "Hey, look, we'd love to have you back here. I heard you've been around games, and I heard that you know you're starting to get an itch." And I said, "I don't know about that, but when 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 your head coach calls, you listen and you pick up." And so before I did that, before I committed to going back and like leaving my job, which I really enjoyed and living um, in Chicago, I loved it. So I decided what I was going to do was still work my corporate job and then go spend time with people that were really, really good in college coaching and really dive in and find out like, is this, does this make sense with uh, this profession? And like, what is it like behind closed doors? And so what I did was at the time, Josh Passner had just taken the job and done really well in his first two years at Memphis uh, from Coach Cal. And he was the young star at the time. And and so I said, man, he's a young star. He answered my my letter. He called me and he said, hey, I want to talk to you. You message me. I appreciate that. How can I help you? I said, can I spend some time with you? So I went and spent time for was time with him for like a week and got to know him and kind of the ins and outs of what they were doing and like help coach their camp. It was really, really kind of him to do that. But I also had an opportunity to get in at Kansas and I spent two weeks at Kansas. So I spent three weeks. I was supposed to be working my job and um, remotely, <laughs> um, which now everybody knows how to do that well. And, and then uh, – but at the time was so foreign 
And then I, I had an opportunity to really dive in at Kansas. And, you know, Bill Self was wonderful with me. Took, he kind of took me under his wing and Danny Manning and Barry Hinson and um, Coach Dooley. Like the whole staff was just wonderful. And what they would do, like at the end of a day or every couple days, they would Hey, how you feeling? What are your questions? What are you? What are the things that you're thinking about? And it really allowed me to feel like welcomed into this community that I knew nothing, nothing about, but like a high level community. Like I didn't deserve to sit in these rooms, in my opinion, right? So I was super humbled. And at the end of my time with uh, at Kansas, I sat down with Bill Self in his office, and I said, he said, well, what, what do you, what, you know, son, 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 what do you want to do? And I said, well, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to lead a multi-million dollar organization. And it wasn't like the money. It was like the responsibility that was tied to that, right? I wanted to do something that really meant something, but I want to like have an impact, right? And he, and he said, son, son, I run a multi-million dollar organization here and, and I can add value too. And I go, bam. He goes, anything you want me to do to help you out, I'll help. You let me know, I'll be there for you. I'll be a mentor, I'll be an advisor. And I was like, I'm in, right? So I called up my, you know, my my former head coach and I, on my ride back from Kansas to Chicago, I said, I'm 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 gonna have to tell my boss this first, but I'm I'm gonna leave that job and I'm gonna go get paid four hundred dollars a month. I'm gonna go get my master's degree and I'm gonna come work for you. I'm gonna learn every day and I'm going to do the best I can to make the program even better. Um, and I don't know how that's possible because you're a legend, but I want to do it and I want to do it with you. And that was it. And so off and running, I was. So what did you learn about coaching in that first year? And what was it like kind of going behind the curtain with a program that you had been a player? Because obviously that relationship is now different when it's not a player coach relationship, but it's a one colleague to another, how did you make that transition? And then what did you learn about coaching that first year that kind of surprised you or maybe was different from what you thought the experience would be like? Well, I always thought I was the coach on the floor. And then as a coach, I realized I knew nothing, right? Um, And it was it was really cool because I got to see a man that I looked up to so much day to day and i my um, the love that i had for him and the appreciation and the i it grew even more to see who he was every day behind closed doors um he was he was such a good he's such a good man and he was such a, a great leader by way of he here's one of the things i learned is he allowed me to make mistakes he knew that there was a lot that i had to learn but he allowed for room for that. And he gave me responsibilities to where he knew, like, if I was going to fail in that, I would fail in a small arena. Um, And it was my own conscience. He knew I worked hard and I cared. And he knew I was uh, somebody that, you know, (laughs) was harder on myself than anybody else ever could. And so for him to drive me, no percentage in it. Right. But he also knew that he needed to give me freedom to make those mistakes. He also gave me opportunities to lead within his program, whether it was from the recruiting efforts or it was an opportunity to really build deep rooted relationships with each player. And and that another lesson that I really learned was, you know, none of the stuff you draw up works if they don't believe the person that's sharing it to them. Um, and, or, or believe in the success that they've, that they've proven. And at this juncture, I hadn't proven anything, right? I, I could talk about playing basketball and having success at the same location that they'd had, uh, or that they were at, right. And going to a final four and doing those things. But, but that's short lived. You have to be an everyday person. So you have to earn that every day. And, and I learned that I, I really did. And so it wasn't, I was right, they were wrong. I had to really build real relationships with them. And that was something that I loved doing and and I really relished in that opportunity. But then it also gave me an opportunity to build up our our leader, build up our head coach. So he didn't have to spend all his time doing that. And he could be the CEO. He could be, he could be our, our leader. And, um, 
So when those players were struggling, it was it wasn't the, the lead dog's fault. It was let's get better. How can I help you? And all he wants is for you to be happy, and he, all he wants is for everybody to win here. So uh, how can we do that together? And so that was that was an honor for me to be able to do that. Yeah, I'm sure to be able to go back to your alma mater and be a part of that, and then just kind of learn on the job, as you said, and being given the opportunity to make mistakes and to learn on the job especially for someone who, like yourself at that point, it sounds like you probably had some aspirations as you went forward to stay and remain in, the, in, in coaching at the college level, which I'm sure leads you to your next opportunity at Ohio State. So talk a little bit about how you get that chance, what that was like, what relationship kind of led you to be able to have that opportunity, and then we can dive into what some of your responsibilities were and what that was like being with the Buckeyes for two years. Yeah, sure. So I was hungry. Once I got a taste of coaching and the college space, I really, I, I, I got hungry. I wanted to learn more. And so in the summers, I would go to different colleges and, and universities and work their basketball camps and network and build relationships with other coaches. And most importantly, just like try to like latch on and learn from them, right? It was less about like getting another job. It was more about like, just tell me everything you know, like everything. And I was fortunate to have gotten in front of some really great people like the John B lines of the world and, and obviously getting back in front of the Bill Selfs at Moore and building, you know, deeper relationships with them. And, and then I got in front of Coach Mata and you know, I was told I had 15 minutes to get around him because his circle is very, very tight. And, you know, um, so I was working their basketball camp and I got 15 minutes. And this is kind of a funny story because I was super nervous at the time. He, he had just come off of, I don't know, like four straight Big Ten championships or whatever it was. And I said, um, they said, hey, you have your 15 minutes now. And I was like, okay, well, I want to make a good first impression. And so I wanted to make sure my hair was right. So I went, ran in the car and I did my <laughs> hair and then I locked my keys in my car. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Like, forget it. Let's, how quickly and positively do, do you respond on this one? So I, you know, I walked in there like, you know, that didn't just happen. Uh, I'll deal with that later. And I got an opportunity to spend 15, 30, 45, an hour, hour, maybe an hour and a half later, we're sitting there chopping it up and, and talking about life. He's an Illinois guy. I'm an Illinois guy. And, and, you know, what I found out was he's, he's, um, as much as we all put some of these guys on this pedestal for all the success that they've had and and we see him on TV as these larger than life, he was as decent of a of a man that I'd ever met, as normal, as conversational, as great of a listener as anybody I, I've ever met. And um, I was blown away. I was blown away. And it wasn't long before um, – I think it was about a week and a half later after that camp, he called me and he said, Hey, we want to create a position for you here at Ohio state. I'd love to find a way to get you here and, and, and make you a part of, of what we're, what we have here. And th there's something that I did with Brad Stevens in his first role in the division one space. And, you know, I think it would be very similar. Uh, what are your thoughts? And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm on, my cell phone, I had to pull over. I go, sounds like a great idea to me, right? So uh, it wasn't, but maybe two months later that I was on staff at Ohio State and we were ripping and running and I was learning every day again in another, it was just a larger scale. Everything was just so much bigger. And uh, so that was, it was wonderful. Great opportunity. All right. So what was similar to your experience as a coach at St. Ambrose? And what was different about the experience at Ohio State? So clearly two different levels of college basketball. I'm sure there were some similarities, but I'm sure there was also some big differences. So maybe just talk about the compare and contrast between the two places. For There's two things. One, in, in my role, uh, very, there, were, there was a similarity. The similarity was people, real relationships diving really deep to get to know and help and serve the players. That's who Coach Mata was, 
and that's who the staff was. And so that was by nature, I think, what made, you know, both of these amazing coaches that I learned from so great. Uh, they were great leaders, but they were great men. And, and so it's amazing the success that followed because the players believed in them. They believed them. They, they really bought in. And, and so that was something that was evident upon arrival. Um, and then what was very similar for me was I was humbled every day. Whether I was at St. Ambrose University, I couldn't believe I was back at my, my school and I was coaching there and like I could help in any way was, was really humbling. But then now being at Ohio State, I was humbled every day because I was around people that were smarter than me every day. And they were on a different wavelength in my mind uh, based off of just life experiences and basketball coaching experiences. And so where did I fit? You know, where, like, what could I do that's better than them? And so finding my niche and finding my role within that staff was something that was a constant. It was, it was fun. It was hard. It was all those things. But I was just so lucky to be around such smart people and some great players. Like, the players were really, really good, but they were also, like, awesome kids. Like, amazing kids. And so that was really fun building those relationships with them and, and really helping them in whatever way I could. Do you want to score more? Training with the Shotical is the easiest way to score more. The game is changing and data scientists are determining the best ways to score. Millions of computer simulations determine where to hit the backboard for the highest percentage shots and when it's best to use the backboard. The Shotical provides those highest percentage shots. From beginners to next level athletes, the Shotical is helping players increase their shooting percentages. Visit Shotical.com now and start scoring more. So what did you take away from that experience that has helped you since you left that job as an entrepreneur in the various ventures that you've had? What did you take away from that? No job is too big or too small. You do it because it's, it's what's best for the team. It's what's best for the success. Maybe not today or tomorrow, but sustainable success. And, uh, you know, Coach Mott is there before everybody, you know, in a lights out gym working with Aaron Kraft to try to get his shot where it needs to be before anybody showed up. You know, albeit he had his coffee in one hand and Aaron's running running around chasing his own <laughs> rebounds. But he 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 was in the weight room with the guys. And so, you know, being uh, a real servant and being somebody that was in it, in the trenches with the guys, doing what they would do, that was something that I learned that I take with me every day and try to look at myself in the mirror and make sure I'm doing every day. Um you know, and, and as the example, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm assuming so that, I'm assuming that obviously, being obviously being at Ohio State, State could have potentially opened could have some potentially doors, for you, some doors for you, whether to remain to at Ohio remain State at or, Ohio whether State or whether to move on to another position, to another position in, college in college basketball coaching. So what was so what the decision-making process, decision -making process for leaving college for leaving coaching, college at, that coaching point, at that point? rather than continuing rather to go along that, path, go along that and path and going along the path of entrepreneurship path of and entrepreneurship starting the basketball starting academy the basketball and eventually academy getting to swish and all the other things that you've done. That you've Just done. talk about the decision, about to, the leave decision to leave college basketball, college coaching, basketball and coaching and why you made that decision. And if you've looked back on it and just, again, just kind of reflect on what that time period in your life was like. Sure. I miss college coaching. I miss the relationships. Right. I miss I miss being in the foxhole when you lose. I miss like trying to help figure it out. And I, I, I miss that. And, and most importantly, I miss like those people. But I had an opportunity to coach the Costa Rican national team. It was like a little sabbatical. I sat down with Coach Mata and I said, Hey, look, I have this really cool opportunity. What do you think? He's like, Yeah, it's like it's like in business. And we would talk 
more business stuff sometimes than we would X's and O's. And that was fun. That was a fun little dynamic that we had um, because he always wanted to learn more about maybe where I was or I had, had been. And he was always super intrigued. And I, I really looked up to him with the way that he approached things that he didn't understand. He was a great listener, asked a ton of questions. And, and so he was like, yeah, it's like a sabbatical. Right. And we talked about like how how companies allow people to go and spend however much time that they needed to go and then come back. And they were this well-rounded human with life experiences that added more value to their company than they did before. Right. And they welcomed them back with open arms. And so it was no different when I decided to go to the Costa Rican national team as they were preparing for the FIBA World Championships. But in that, I gained a lot of clarity. And and what I realized was. One, I loved my wife, and at the time, she came down at the very end of that, that time in, in Costa Rica, and I proposed to her, and we got engaged, and that night, we had the conversation kind of like, hey, like, well, what are we going to do uh, right. like the, the, the rest of our life? Right. As most uh, serious couples like my w wife and I uh, would have on their first dinner as engaged couples. Uh, but we sat down and we really kind of talked about like what the next step would be. And so I explored potentially going to Indianapolis and building a business with a friend who uh, he was on the Globetrotters and he was blowing up. I mean, he was doing running a great training academy in Indianapolis and uh, was training all these great players. And he thought, well, maybe you should always come here. And he was always like, hey, come down here and we'll blow this up. We'll do it together. And I thought about it. I really did. And we were really close to making that happen. Very, very close. And, and then I just said, well, if, you know, I could go to Indianapolis and do it, or I could just go to Chicago and do it. And here's one of the things that building a basketball academy uh, or, or a basketball organization meant to me. It meant having a bigger impact, um, not the 12 guys in, in the locker room a year. It was like, if I do this right, like I can help more, more kids and just like share what I've learned. Like that could be cool, right? And I certainly didn't. I thought I had it all figured out, like on how it was going to look and play out, right? Um, everybody would want to train with me because I've been here and I've done this. Uh, I was pretty clueless. And it's amazing uh, what it's turned into and why, but it was it was definitely a group effort. My, my, fam my family's been very supportive. And my wife has been just a rock. You know, we've we've experienced some some heartache, and we've experienced, you know, some ups and downs, um, as as many couples do, right? In in um, in life, and we're just so happy to be here now, and to have what we have, and to be continuing to be as passionate as we are, even more every day. Now that we're building and creating and. Um, doing more for more people. And so that's been, it's really cool how it's transpired into what it has today. So how did the vision of what you thought it was going to be, how does that differ from what it is today? In other words, what did you think it was going to be and what is it? Well, it's, it's super selfish. Uh, I, 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 when I left o Ohio State and, and the Costa Rica national team, I thought people would train with me because – that's where I'd been and no one else had done that. Right. Can you like, can you can hear how selfish that sounds, but that's exactly how I, uh, how I thought. And I would start a business that way. Well, it starts with one person. If you don't serve that person, um, in a way that you can actually get them better and serve their specific needs, then it's, it's kind of irrelevant. And then what happened was when I decided it, it had to be less about me and where I'd been and more about them and where they are. Everything changed. Everything changed. And the business blew up. And, you know, we have, <laughs> I think I mentioned earlier, we had, we've had players come from six different continents around the world. We have a kid come from Madagascar every summer to just come and train with us. And, you know, players from seven different NBA organizations, you know, have worked with us in seven different 
G League organization. And, and it, it, it's kind of taken on a new life of its own because it hasn't been about me or where I've been. A lot of players don't know these things that I've shared with you. They don't know where, you know, that I played at this level or in that country or, um, you know, they don't know that I coached. A lot of people don't know I coached at Ohio State. <laughs> right. And, and right, I thought that yeah, would be understood. a big driver. You know, it's certainly on my biography page and on our website, but it's not something I talk about because it's them we talk about. It's them we want to get to know deeper. And because we're able to get to know them deeper, we're able to help them to like the core, right? And so it's been really, really fun in that light. What's been, what was the biggest challenge of getting that started and keeping it going once you came to the realization that you were there to serve the players that you were working with as opposed to, for lack of a better way of saying it, serving yourself? What's been the biggest logistical challenge to to building the Basketball Academy into not just a fun project, but a viable business? It's a great question. I think I knew when I was asking those hard questions, like, why are more kids not training with me? Like, why not me? I have the best branding, you know, like I have the background, I have the knowledge. And it's amazing how much my teaching has changed and developed in five years now. Like it's, it's, it's crazy to think what I was teaching then to now. I kind of feel a little bad for <laughs> some of those kids and some of those players to where I am now. I feel so much more well-versed in the space. I, I guess if you feel that in any space and you've been there long enough, right? But um, I think that's when it was, when I really started asking the hard questions that I started diving a little bit deeper into like if you want to make a real change in the business, where does that start? And it started with me and it started with really becoming someone that could help and be more present for the people that needed the help. And I, I didn't, you know, and, and that helped me <laughs> in turn as yeah, a result of helping sense. them. It, it, it served the, the greater purpose of starting to build a business. And then as more people started coming on, you learn about, you know, where you're putting your money and where you're not putting your money and, you know, what type of marketing funds are here and, you know, just all that type of stuff that you don't, you think you know that you don't and you start learning and uh, you start asking questions of other people in the space. And it, it was, it was, there was definitely a learning curve to it, but now I, you know, I, I pride myself in trying to help anybody else that's in this space. And if you have any questions, like how can I help you and get you to the next level a little bit quicker than I got there. So it's been fun. Yeah, absolutely. So who do you, who's your go-to mentors or people that you look to? Let's take it in two different directions. So from a basketball standpoint, when you're talking about, Hey, what I taught and the, the things that I was doing five years ago compared to what I'm doing now, where did you go to, improve your craft in that area and then who do you go to on the business side as a mentor in that arena when you have a question that's not basketball related that but that's marketing directed or that's finance directed or that's facility directed where do you go for that kind of advice well early on i i thought i could do all of that i thought i could do all of it and and early on it was good that i that i had to learn how to do all of it but as things grew and my bandwidth uh, shortened, then it was important for me to start giving up responsibility, um, whether it was to, to, to other trainers, just let them do it. Like the business is going to grow because, you know, they're going to be here and they're empowered. And, and so um, and, and just being more open to suggestions and being more open to other trainers coming in and sharing what they've learned. Like I didn't have it all figured out. Like what other things have you learned uh, from the places you've been as a player or as a coach and, and just being open to that. And I've learned so much. Sometimes I'll sit and watch, um, you know, them just do what they do so I can learn. And so uh, as far as you know, the finances, as far as the marketing, what I've done is I've surrounded people surrounded myself with people who are really good at that and and who educate me 
and I ask questions and I allow them to be great at that. And then I stay really, really focused on the vision side of the business for, you know, Spart Sports, the, the, the academy that we have um, with the camps, clinics and the travel teams and the individual workouts and all that stuff. So I stay vision focused and then um, and then I, I and then I find time to get get my hands dirty and, and stay stay close and keep my hand on the pulse of, of what's going on and with the families and the kids. Um, because I think if you don't do that, you become removed and I think you lose uh, sight of what's most important, which is, you know, really like serving the kids and, and their growth as young people um, by way of this cool vehicle is basketball. So uh, surrounding myself with really like a lot smarter people than me in respective fields and then really staying focused on the vision and like bringing everybody back in to like really focus on one common goal. Right. And so that's been, that's been a lot of fun for me. So it's like kind of yeah, like I, now I'm, yeah. I'm like a head coach where in, in a different space than I would have been um, in, in college or professional coaching. How difficult was it for you to take that first step of delegating and not being the person who had their hand in everything? Obviously, once you do it, you start to see that there's tremendous benefit to being able to delegate and put things in the hands of people who are better, smarter at those particular aspects of whatever it is, whether it's, again, hiring a basketball trainer or whether it's hiring hiring an accountant or a marketer to do the jobs that they do. But I think that first step of releasing those those jobs that maybe you did at the beginning as an entrepreneur, I think those can be scary. So how did you handle that particular step? Well, you make mistakes. So like I made mistakes early on. I, I want I believed in certain people and you start understanding certain people that can do it and certain people that you that can't do it. And I'm like the guy that's, I'm the glass half full guy. And I believe that every, like if you get deep enough in their soul, you'll connect and they'll never let you down. And sometimes they let you down. And sometimes they're just not a good fit for your organization, not because they're bad people or not because they're not capable of the job, but because they're just not a good fit. And so that's hard. Like that's hard. And it's hard because I want to like I wanted desperately to give up responsibility, but sometimes it wasn't reciprocated and and in by way of people actually delivering, and so it 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 stuns you a little bit, and you go well well then I'm not I'm I refuse I'm going to hold on a little bit longer to these reins, and you know it's 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 really hard, but when you do it and you find the right people. Man, oh man, you know, going to sleep at night is just different. It's just different. You know, my mind can be in a in a in a totally different place as opposed to problem solving, you know, the things that I, I don't even know how to do and I'm just like trying to figure it out versus like staying vision focused on problem solving the things that could be and driving our business to a bigger and better place and creating more opportunities for these kids than they would have other, other where, you know, any, uh, any other place than ours was important. And so it's, it's hard. It still is hard, you know, giving up that responsibility, but, you know, understanding that my priorities are, you know, the people that, that work for our, for our organization, right? Like though that there are priority, the, the kids that we, and, and the players that we serve and their families. And, and most importantly, it's my family and being able to make sure that I'm able to delegate so I can spend the ample amount of time with my family is, is just so, so important to me. I want to be a, a really present, great father and build these great memories with my, and have wonderful experiences with my family and my, and, and be a great husband. And, and those are the things that really forced me to say, somebody else has got to do it because I've got dinner with my wife and uh, <laughs> we're going to sit down and we're going to have a conversation for two hours and I may listen for all two hours, but it's important and I have to do it. 
Hey, hoop heads, we all hate ankle sprains, and they happen way too often. Ankle injuries are the number one sports-related injury. Arise is trying to change that. With the iFast, your athletes get preventative protection and full mobility. Athletes no longer need to wear bulky braces that limit performance and give mediocre protection. Anyone playing sports should be using these products. Keep your athletes in the game. Don't wait for them to get hurt to take action. Visit www.arise.com, spelled A-R-Y-S-E, and use the code HOOPHEADS to get 20% off the future of performance. That's A-R-Y-S-E dot com with promo code HOOPHEADS to get 20% off. All right, what's the number one piece of advice that you would have for somebody who is a basketball trainer, they're a solo entrepreneur, and they want to build their training business. If you could just give them one piece of advice, what would that piece of advice be? Can I can I say more than one thing? Absolutely. Okay. A lot of trainers, what I've found, they make it about them and like what they've done for the kids that they've worked with. And I get it. You were a part of it, but if that is the mindset, it's really hard to get out of. And if you can make it about them and how great they were, how far they came from that point to that point, your success speaks to that. So, so you don't have to speak on you. You can speak on them and, and how wonderful and how hard they've worked and how great they've gotten. So that's one. It has to be about them, like to the core. Like, and if you don't believe that, I don't know. I don't know the sustainability. I think it becomes a revolving door because I think people eventually see through that. And then, if you want to make it a business, then you have to get around other people that have made it a business and ask them their biggest mistakes. And ask them what they did after the mistake. Like, if you made, what was your biggest financial mistake you ever made? <laughs> you know, what was the biggest um, marketing mistake or flaw that you ever made? Right? That's going to save you a ton of money. Um, and that's going to save you a ton of time and a ton of thought um, and and embarrassment and whatever it is that it's going to save you. But And then ask them, what is it that got you to the next level after you did that? And and the answer is tried and true right there. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And um, and it's okay to have competition. That's the third thing. It's okay to have competition. Let it drive you. And and you don't have to uh, you don't have to like them, but don't don't um, don't make them some a part of conversation. Right. Like if somebody says, you know, who's your competition, you don't have to talk about them like they're they're bad people or they don't do it the right way. It's their way. And and you have a, a your own unique way. And there's enough of the pie to go around. Right. And ultimately, if you keep doing right by the people that you serve, you're going to have enough pie for you and you don't have to steal or be unkind to to build a business that's sustainable. Yeah, I think that's a great piece of advice. I think I see that you can you can see it in all walks of life, but you definitely see it in the basketball space, whether it be AAU programs, you'd be see basketball trainers where it's just everybody's kind of trying to carve out their own little piece and they don't always necessarily have good things to say about the other people that are around there. We're ultimately you would hope that anybody who's in the business of you know training kids or having a basketball academy or building an AAU program, that the reason why they're doing it is sure it's a business and I get that, but it's also I always like to say that it's it should be about it should be about the kids that you're serving and ultimately I think if you're doing that, then as you said there's there's enough room for lots of p- different people who potentially can do it in different ways, but as long as the bottom line is you're trying to do it to serve the kids that are part of whatever it is that you do. Then I think you're then I think you're in the right space. So let's transition from the academy. Let's get into Swish. Talk to me a little bit about how you came up with the idea for the product, and just explain for our audience exactly 
what the product is, what it does, and who it's for. Yeah, so Swish was developed uh, one day, and no, what happened was it was like I had an aha moment. I was working with a 14 year old girl, and I said, Hey, you got a problem with your shot, let's fix it. And her elbows, her elbows are popping out and, you know, there's no way to fix it. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm real keen on, you know, the, the space that I'm giving, you, you know, the young people we work with. Okay. Um, because that's, that's important in our space as, as it is any space. Right. And so I'm so, you know, I'm not going to touch her on her arm every, every time she shoots it, but man, she needs it. So how am I going to do that? How am I going to give her the feedback that she needs every time? So I put a caution tape around her that was in the closet <laughs> in, in the gym and then I put a rope around her I go none of these are going to do the trick she's got like rope burn I'm going this isn't it and so she left and she came back and then you know it was like a week later I said have you been working on your shot you've been working on what I was telling you she's like yeah but I just I still can't feel what you're talking about and I was like wow that was it I can't be there when I'm when she's away how can I be there when I'm with her and it was it I said let me dive deeper let me see if I can make something to solve her problem. And then it like ballooned into like getting into with engineers and sports science individuals and patent attorneys and marketing team and sourcing individual, uh, you know, so it's been two years now and we did it. Like we did it. It's been so fun diving into the makeup of, of a shot. I was never a product guy. Didn't really use like cones. I, I didn't really use much. You know, my high school coach made us use heavy balls and it was a nightmare, you know. But other than that, I, I was really never a product guy. And I was like, how can I make it so that it doesn't feel so product? Even though like it is, it's absolutely a product. So it had to be swaggy. It had to be cool. It had to be trendy. And that's important, right, um, when you're selling. And so we got to a point where we now have developed a product that, that is all those things. It's swaggy. It's comfortable. It, it allows an athlete to be just that, athletic. But it controls 41% of the shot. And imagine if 41% of the shot is controlled it's a lot easier for the rest of your shot to get controlled, right? And if 41, 41% is controlled, like what else are you teaching? Maybe one part of the shot, right? So what we did was a lot of people talk about the shot being muscle memory, right? And you say, man, if you just get your muscle memory down, it's going to take you know thousands and thousands of shots. But if you can get that muscle memory, how about this? Let's go back. Let's go to science. Let's go to, you ever heard of the phrase, it's like riding a bike? Yeah, me too. What does that mean? It means it's like you never forget it once you start it, right? And so on average, what we've learned is that it takes you 45 minutes to learn how to ride a bike. Once you put your feet on those pedals, they start to push and turn themselves and your legs learn to turn in that motion and subsequently your arms and the rest of your body learn how to balance okay and so in the same light this shooting sleeve right this shooting apparatus swish it controls 41 percent of your shots so it teaches you how to shoot it the right way and the rest of your body just learn how to get on balance and so what we're using is procedural memory which is the same science that people use when they talk about riding a bike. It's procedural memory. And it can expedite the process in getting better and learning not only what's right versus wrong. Like you're not going to go up to a bike and like pedal it wrong ever again. You're going to know exactly your body knows how to do it. And it's no different with shooting a shot. What, what I've found is most players don't know what a good shot feels like or what it looks like. And so what if we could teach them by way of controlling it for them? And every shot you can guarantee a quality rep. Well, we did that. And so, uh, you know, I think one of the greatest things about this product is we, we've developed a three-step shooting process. 
with it. So with just the shooting sleeve, the Swiss shooting sleeve, you're going to, you're going to make shots and, and you're going to be great. Okay. We're going to get you better quicker. But with this three-step shooting process tied to it, it makes it so dynamic, Mike. It's unbelievable. And the hardest thing about shooting basketball shots is it's so complicated. You could be doing so many things wrong. So we've simplified it by way of controlling more of it. And then we've simplified it again to the next degree by giving you three steps. That's it. No more, no less three-step shooting process and we just had a pro in the gym the other day and he's like man i'm going to use this to warm up every day this is like my comfort blanket this reaffirms how like the all the good things that i do in my shot this means the first 10 minutes of me shooting is quality shots it's it's good shots and i can focus on the one part of my shot that i always struggle with which is my hands or my follow-through or whatever it is I said, I love it. I said, but what about the 10-year-old you or the 10-year-old you? He goes, man, I would have had this in a heartbeat. I wish I would have had this. So I didn't have to shoot those thousands and thousands of shots of, fig- of just trying to figure this thing out. And so that's what's so exciting. It kind of appeals to all of the above. If you're a pro, if you're a beginner, you can learn how to shoot or you can reaffirm that, hey, man, I'm doing it right every time. So And everything in between. Right. So it's been really, really cool to be able to bring this to 2021 with all the new exciting things that are happening in all of our lives in 2021. This is one of those that that's going to have some standing power for a number of different reasons. But we're really excited. So tell me a little bit about the three step shooting process. What is that? If I have one of these products and I'm wearing it and I'm trying to work on my shot, what does that three-step shooting process mean for me as I'm working on my game? It means a couple different things. That's a great question. So the first thing that it means is if you're struggling or if you're trying to figure out what uh, a good shot looks like, you start from square one. So instead of square one, we say step one. And step one looks as it looks like this. So imagine yourself with your hands on the ball. We've got to get our hands right. We've got our, we've got our hands right, and we're standing straight up and down. Your arms are in front of your body, okay, um, laid down in front of your body. That's step one. There's nothing else to it, standing straight up and down. Now, two is where you load up. Now, your knees go over your toes, your shoulders over your knees, and that ball is being brought up in unison up to your chest below your chin. Now, some of the taller players, more advanced players, are going to bring it up a little bit higher. Okay? I understand that. I get it. But we really like to keep it in the core, the strongest part of your body. If you look at any sport, you look at the most athletic position. Okay? And that's... You know, you've seen a shortstop over their toes, right? Hands out in front. Their cores are engaged, right? If you're standing over the, 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 the plate, at home plate, you're over your toes, right? Those hands are nice and comfortable. Your chin's over your toes. Nice and, right? If you finish a pitch, where are you standing, right? You're over your toes. You're really in an athletic position. You're in a defensive stance, right? You're kicking a soccer ball. Everything is over your toes in a very athletic position. Well, why wouldn't we do that in basketball? Well, we're going to do that in basketball. So that's where we're going to be at step two. Okay. Step three, the ball leads north. Okay. And everything else is engaged going up with it and following behind. And you release up and over the rim. And what happens is, is with this shooting sleeve, you have one on your your right arm, which is free, and your left arm that actually has... Um, On the inside of it, just above the elbow and below the tricep, you're going to have a bridge. And it goes all the way around that that bicep. And it's going to go all the way across your chest. And you're going to loop your right hand in. And you're going to put it all the way up above your elbow and below your tricep. And so now what you have is something that keeps your elbows in from start to finish. So they're always where they're supposed to be. 
And what I've found is most times when you're super young, the first thing that you do to generate more power is you put your elbows back. And when your elbows go back, guess what they do? They go out. And now you're fighting like heck to get those things back in and then up. And so you're already batting down, you're, you're behind in the count here, you know. And so if we could eliminate that negative movement in the shot, by placing that bridge right in front of your body and not allowing that negative movement going backwards and in turn also keeping your elbows in frame we keep we, we talk about being in frame i was talking about this with a pro the other day he said explain in frame to me so it's really inside your frame of your body that's where your elbows should remain um and that's what that adjustable bridge that goes from one elbow to the other does and and then you're connected all the way through your shot so it's really really fun yeah it sounds really cool obviously i've been on and watched the video and looked at what it is that you guys do but just for somebody who's listening explain because you have the bridge as you describe it connecting from one arm to the other how do you envision a player utilizing it. So if I'm going to go and let's just let's just pick out an age. Let's say I'm a uh, let's say I'm an eighth grade basketball player and I want to improve my shot. What does it look like when I'm going to go out and use this product and try to improve my shot? What kinds of things could I be doing with this on that's going to help me to get better? Well, first off, you're going to want to work your way out. So when we talk about working, working your way out, you want to utilize a three-step process and you want to find sw success early and close. So you want to be close to the rim and you want to find success. And for us, success, we, 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 don't, we don't settle for anything less than swishes. And we know that swishes mean perfection. You did everything right in that shot. And we want to celebrate that, which is why – we we name the company Swish and the product Swish. So what we've done is is when you start close to that rim, we want to go through our one, two, three step shooting process. We want you to swish it. Go ahead, take a step back. You earned it. And you work your way all the way back to your range, whatever your range is, um, and sometimes inside your range. Um, and then now here's a great opportunity. You get you put one bounce down from from where you started two feet three feet four feet from the rim wherever you started you put one dribble down with your right and you're going through your your clean pickup two three get your swoosh you work your way back maybe you get two swishes three swishes at a spot before you move really generate the, and the level of confidence that you need to to move back and to get farther away and then before you know it you're doing your left hand you're throwing it out in front of you You've got your one-two step. You got a jab step shot. There's a there's a hundred different things that you can do with it. If you've got a doctor dish or a shoot away or whatever it is that you use um, to retrieve the ball or whatever it is, now you can do more stuff on the move. You can do stuff with a partner. But if you're one kid and you want to get better, you stay within 18 feet and you shoot your one, two, three step process until you find your rhythm, until you find your groove. And then what I would suggest is you take that left sleeve off. You keep that right sleeve on because right on the wrist of that, right where the watch is, when any anybody ever asks you, they say, what time is it? And you're in the game, you say, it's time to swish it. And you point to your wrist and you mean <laughs> it. But you're gonna keep that sleeve on and then you're gonna take the left one off that has the bridge attached to it. And you're gonna feel in those first five reps and you're gonna go, whoa, my arms feel free. They feel a little bit loosey-goosey here. Why is that? Well, you've been restricted and your body's been told what to do for the last 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes, okay? So what is it telling you? And what did it feel like when you were shooting for, those, for that 15 minutes? that's where you need to that's where you need to be so now you've got the instant feedback that you need that i could never give someone when they were away from me i could never give that to them but this product will give you that and it'll tell you exactly where you need to be with it without it on you because you've done so many reps with it and now they're shooting swooshes from the same spots that they just did 
um, and you go through the same routine and build up the confidence in the real reps without the product. And this is truly now the first product that you can take from training to tip off because of how now you've got that other piece of it on you. And it's like that blanket. It's that that level of confidence that like I've made these shots before and I know every time I catch it what my shot's supposed to feel like. I've seen it go through the rim. I know how it feels like and I know how to get it back to that. And that's one of the hardest things in game to go. I can't tell you how many times players come up to you and go, hey, coach. I can't find it. It's not there today. You go, hold up a second. Just get it to two. <laughs> Remember two feels like, let's get it there. And all of a sudden, that's it. Now we're talking scalability. And maybe that's the next point that we're talking about is like, hey, you know, how does this thing translate on a global scale and from one age to the next and from one coach to another coach to one coach to a player. But uh, yeah, and, that, and that's really how I would suggest working with it if it was, if you were an eight-year-old or an 11-year-old or 15-year-old in, in, in the driveway. All right. Talk about that scale and how you envision this product getting out into the marketplace and having an impact on players at all levels of the game. Well, one of the things I would do is when I was building this out, I, I would really like start polling people from different spaces in basketball, right? Like a college coach, high school coach, AAU, middle school, grade school. And then like people are doing camps and clinics and showcases. And what I found was camps and clinic and showcases, there's a million of them around and there's going to be a million more in year 2021. Okay like additional ones. So what they're always looking for is what's my value add? What's my differentiator? Uh, ooh, 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 I got one. <laughs> I can guarantee that you can teach them to shoot quicker, find success quicker with a three-step shooting process that I can scale a three-step shooting process. So, you know, scalability is based on simplicity, right? Like if I can't, if I'm not there doing it, can I, will this thing still be dynamic without me there, right? I believe this three-step process is absolutely dynamic, especially paired with the swish sleeve. So that becomes, at every camp and clinic, it becomes a station. And every player comes to a camp and clinic and they receive it with their t-shirt. It's a upcharge, and all of a sudden these camps and clinics go, look, no other camp and clinic is doing this. Well, for now, right? But no other camp and clinic is doing this, and we can get them better quicker. And when they leave, these players are going, hey man, I'm using this on my own. Where did I get this? I got this at this camp and clinic. Do you think they're gonna go back to that camp and clinic next year? Absolutely absolutely and you know what they're going to go back as a better player and you know who goes to camps and clinics that has good players other good players value add times 10 it's no different with showcases now as far as the scalability you know i was talking to a guy that does camps and clinics all around the world he's one of the, like he's a premier skill development coach sponsored by you know major uh shoe brand and he said, hey, man, like I'm in front of 100 players <laughs> in one gym in China, and I've got 100 coaches standing, waiting in the wings, taking notes. And I've got to communicate how to shoot properly. Like it's all dependent on, on the, the translator standing next to me. And um, I don't know that that's, that that's really quality. How can I differentiate myself from any trainer, skill development coach around the world? Bingo. Nailed it. I can say one, two, three in Chinese, in Spanish, in French. Oh, now we're talking. Now, hold up a second. What if we put a swish leave on everybody and they're all looking at me at the same time? While I say one, two, three in their native language, you think they could pick up on it? Absolutely. Do you know that? Do you think they know what it feels like? I bet they can. And then here's a deal. Now I'm going to send them off to the hoops. Do I have to be there at every single rep coaching them up? No. They got their own specific coach coaching them up. It's a swish sleeve, man. And now I'm coaching up one or two thing, one thing in their shot that's really poor. 
that's you know prohibiting them from being great and I don't have to coach up the entire shot that's all quirky and aw, odd and awkward and uncomfortable right so that's what excites me about the scalability of this and it allows us and we talked about this earlier it allows us as coaches to reach more kids it's the whole reason I left college coaching how can I impact more kids in a positive way and get them better quicker and I think we did it all right so how do people find it what does it cost where do they go to learn more about it beyond what we've talked about here tonight give us the website give us the social media let people know where they can get it and what it costs so that people who are interested can go out and experience it for themselves absolutely so first off along the same lines of trying to get it in as many people as possible around the world we wanted to make it affordable we know it's a high-end product but we wanted to make it affordable so we did that it's 39.99 you can go to swishofficial.com to get yours we have a white version we have a black version and we love it swish official s w s h official.com you can also go to instagram and really follow our journey at swish s w s h underscore official and we love it. It, it, it you can contact me you can connect with me you can share your story about using it for the first time experiencing your first swish with the swish sleeve uh at coach c sparts and to, to connect with me and so yeah we're really really excited Awesome. Christopher, we cannot thank you enough for coming on tonight and not only sharing about your product, but also sharing about your basketball journey, which again, I think that one of the things that I love about the podcast is just being able to hear the different stories of how people got to where they are in their basketball life and their basketball career and hearing the stories of that journey and learning about what drove them to get to the point where they are, whether that's through coaching, whether that's through entrepreneurship, whether that's through some other avenue where they're having an impact using the game of basketball to do that. And so I just want to personally say thanks to you for coming on and sharing that. I cannot thank you enough for spending this hour and 20 minutes or so with us to talk about your product, to talk about your basketball journey. And to everyone out there, thanks for listening, and we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. If you have an existing podcast or are looking to launch your own pod but aren't sure where to start, the team at My Podcast Manager can help. Our podcast team works behind the scenes so you can do what you do best. We'll help you launch your podcast, make it sound great, and free up your time for the more enjoyable parts of podcasting. If you're ready to put your podcast editing, production, and promotion on autopilot with a trusted team of podcasting professionals, visit MyPodcastManager.com to get started. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball.